All right, welcome everyone. Good to be here. Um, so uh, you may wonder after Chris read my bio, why in the world I'm talking about literature and the power of stories. That's a question I've asked myself. The way that this actually came about was last term, the series was on psychology and faith. And I gave a couple talks during that series, which is much more kind of where I live. But um, when uh, um, Ryan, Carol and I were talking about ideas, I was talking about the psychology of Dostoevsky and that that might be an interesting topic for a class on psychology. So um, that's kind of where this came from, was looking at the psychology um, of Dostoevsky and his characters. And so I say that because I am no expert on literature. I'm a reader. I'm sometimes a writer. Um, my relationship, just to give you a little tidbit, uh, Chris also mentioned that my background is in biology. When I was in my undergraduate program in zoology, they made me take two literature classes to graduate. <laughs> I had to take one on literature and one on poetry. And I was indignant because I was a science major. Who needs that stuff? And <laughs> so it wasn't until um, God, in his, um, with his sense of humor, brought me to Gutenberg that I started reading <laughs> uh, the liberal arts and um, really had a paradigm shift about um, what was valuable uh, in terms of the breadth of education that we can get from um, all kinds of writings and authors. So, and, and one of the books that was very significant for me actually was The Brothers Karamazov. When I, when I read it, I was actually, um, when I was working as a tutor here, um, as was the case at that time, we'd kind of sit around the table and go, so who wants to lead this discussion? Who wants to lead that discussion? And, and uh, the Brothers Karamazov discussion came up and I thought, well, that's a good push for me to read that book. <laughs> so I went, sure. And I had like eight weeks <laughs> until the discussion. And so I like went through the book and figured out how many pages a day <laughs> I would have to read to get through it in time to lead this discussion. And, um, and it was about 40-ish, I think. But I did it. I did it. I made it. And, and it was really, uh, it, I will talk a little bit more about this, about how literature, how novels change us, how stories change us. But I feel like that book in particular changed me in certain ways. Um, as those of you who have read it will probably understand. And those of you who haven't read it, I highly encourage you to read it. Um, I'm not going to assume that everybody's read it here tonight as I talk about it, but um, one of the ways it changed me was it kind of said I could be a reader. I mean, I never thought I would pick up a book that's like, you know, eight or 900 pages and actually dive into <laughs> it and get it done. Because I really was, has, have never been, I mean, I've been a reader, but not a reader. You know, I'm not, I wasn't one of those kids that always had a nose in the book, that kind of thing. So um, I was more kind of playing with lizards and, stuff. So that's why I went into biology. Um, okay, so I want to give a little overview of where we're going to go tonight. I'm going to talk about um, this uh, kind of the wide Western split. Um, and I'm going to make a couple of distinctions between uh, very briefly, because again, no expert, but um, on epistemology and then also in, on Kierkegaard and his view. That's kind of the subject object split and uh, two different ways of looking at that. And then I'm going to talk about the role of stories, the truth in novels. I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, uh, or maybe even mostly, I don't know, about um, the Brothers Karamazov and also Crime and Punishment. Those are the two that I'm going to land on a little bit. And then I'm going to talk about um, a theme kind of overarching is going to be this idea of reason and imagination as two faculties that we have for um, discovering truth. They're both truth-bearing faculties, and that's kind of what I'm going to describe and talk about a little bit. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about double reflection, which is a coined term by Kierkegaard. Okay, so very briefly, um, you probably are aware if you've grown up in our culture in the last 60 years, that um, there's a real fault line in our culture between facts and values. And um, the fact level is certainly the privileged level. 
in our society and certainly in the academy um, where um, science is, you know, supreme fact level. And so what's happened in that is that values then have been re relegated to a different category and are kind of personal opinion. And so there's facts and then there's opinion. And you can separate those two things and kind of dismiss or, or make very individual, make values very individual, that they really don't have a, a common or um, feature that we can land on together. Um, and so, and now of course we've come all the way to, that started with the Enlightenment maybe, we've come all the way to this postmodern sort of view that really any story is a, is a good story. Um, we're, we're creating reality by making our own stories. There's all kinds of um, interesting ideas about uh, how language works and how it doesn't work and, and we've gotten, we've gone round the bend on a lot of this <laughs> stuff in my opinion. Um, so the, the big fault line then of course is between the objective and the subjective. So the object is the thing that's um, factual and the subjective is um, our opinions about it or our um, interpretation of it. So we've gone from where, when I was uh, doing science, it was very much, which was a long time ago now, uh, 30 years ago or so, it was, we were still very much in this place of science is where authority is and science is where, and it's very objective. So the beauty of science was that we could get rid of all that other stuff and just know what was actually true. And of course that didn't take into account um, hundreds of years of philosophical questions about um, how the observer is also involved in understanding the object that's being observed. And so that's where this kind of the fault line comes down through objective and subjective. And then I think from there it penetrates to this, um, this also this divide between reason and imagination. And um, so if, if these are two great faculties for actually grasping and integrating facts and values, we have done a tremendous disservice in seeing them as opposed to one another. Um, and even to uh, separate them is almost unendurable for humans because they are so true to who we are as humans. They are so much a part of us as human beings, these two pieces of us. And so to split them apart can put us in kind of a perpetual crisis because um, it, it's a dislocation of sorts and kind of splits us in half as humans. Um, and so uh, an actual experience of this was um, written by um, one academic that we are a lot of us around here are familiar with, C.S. Lewis, who um, reflected back on his early experience in the academy. Um, he wrote this in Surprised by Joy, and uh, so he was reflecting back on an experience that he had that he understood better at the point at which he was writing about it. Um, and this is what he says in Surprised by Joy. The two hemispheres of my mind were in the sharpest contrast. On the one side, a many-sided sea of poetry and myth. On the other, a glib and shallow rationalism. Nearly all that I loved, I believed to be imaginary. Nearly all that I believed to be real, I thought grim and meaningless. And so you can see how penetrating this experience is of saying that our reason and our imagination are at odds with each other rather than actually God-given functions that can work together. Uh, I also discovered a poem. It's okay if I throw in a little poetry here. This is, this is a poem that um, Lewis actually wrote before he became a believer. And it's kind of thick, so, um, and I'm certainly no, again, no poetry expert. Um, but I, I do want to read this poem. And, um, and I'll put it up here, uh, if you can 
see that. I don't know if it's the whole thing is up there, actually. It's actually not the whole thing up there. <laughs> oh, well. So um, you'll have to just listen to the last three lines. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, and this is his, this is written probably, they think, in about 1928. And so it was before his conversion. And, um, and he's wrestling at this moment of how does reason and imagination, how do they work together? Do they work together? Because he was in the academy where they were not supposed to work together and reason was privileged. Um, Set on the soul's Acropolis, the reason stands, a virgin armed, com commercing with celestial light. And he who sins against her has defiled his own virginity. No cleansing makes his garment white. So clear is reason. But how dark, imagining, warm, dark, obscure, and infinite, daughter of night. Dark is her brow. The beauty of her eyes with sleep is loaded, and her pains are long, and her delight. Tempt not, Athena. Wound not in her fertile pains, Demeter, Demeter, nor rebel against her mother right. Oh, who will reconcile in me both maid and mother, who make in me a concord of the depth and the height, who make imaginations dim exploring touch, ever report the same as intellectual sight. Then could I truly say and not deceive, then wholly say that I believe. So there's a little power in poetry there in Lewis's capturing of that experience for him. And by the way, anytime you want to interrupt me or make a comment or a question, please feel free. So I like discussions better than lectures, so jump in anytime. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to very briefly talk about a little bit about Kierkegaard. And the reason I'm doing this is because I think that um, the artfulness of the novel it has its power in something that Kierkegaard has um, identified and understood as what we might call indirect communication. And, um, and double reflection will become a part of that. So I want to just briefly say that the object-subject split that I just talked about in epistemology, which is kind of how we know what we know, the, the philosophy of how we know things is epistemology. Um, the object-subject split there is different than the one that Kierkegaard is identifying in his works. Um, what he is talking about, and he, he defines these terms very um, kind of over and over again, very diligently. Um, for Kierkegaard, the objective is anything that you can apprehend or know directly. So um, it can be a fact, it can be history, it can be something that I, I discover, but there's kind of a conclusion to it. And I, I find out something, and then I can communicate it directly because it's got a result, right? And so for Kierkegaard, that's kind of the objective sphere. He would also call it where direct communication happens. So I can communicate things in that realm very directly. The subjective for Kierkegaard is much more, um, it's not about my, it's, some, it's a little bit about my interpretation, kind of like in the epistemology, but more than that for Kierkegaard, it's the subjective existing person takes in that direct or that objective information and has an existing relation and response to it. And so it's a, it, it ends up being a decision that's, that's going to be made as a result of the impact of that information. How it impacts my actual existing life is much more what he's interested in. And, and a big reason for that is that his project had to do with kind of waking up the Danish Lutheran Church which, from his perspective, knew all the stuff in the, on the objective level. They, they could tell you their doctrines and what they believed, but he didn't see it really alive in their lives. And so he wanted to say, okay, you might know all that stuff, but you have to have a relationship with that stuff. <laughs> and ultimately with the creator, with, with God, who is actually who we're dealing with here as existing um, infinite human beings. So um, let's see if I'm at all following my notes. Let's see. 
Um, yeah, so, so then when we get to the idea of double reflection, um, and this is a little trickier and certainly, I mean, I've, I've read him for a while and sometimes I think I'm starting to get him, <laughs> but it's, he's a little slippery. But um, the way I'm thinking about his view of double reflection at this point is that um, the, when I hear information on that objective level, that direct level, that's, I take it in and that's my first reflection. But then when it, it lands on me in an, a different way and I respond to it out of my subjectivity and out of my ex existing uh, human being person, <laughs> that's, double, that's the second reflection. And so for an example of that would be, let's think about gratitude. So you could hear a speaker say, we ought to be grateful. We ought to practice gratitude, right? You can hear that and go, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Can't argue with that. <laughs> I'll go with that. Um, but Kierkegaard would say that's kind of a hollow uh, acceptance of that unless it produces questions and engagement. And so the questions it might produce might be, so, okay, if I'm supposed to be grateful, should I, am I just grateful for the good things that happen? Or am I going to be grateful even when difficult things happen? Um, I got to work with that. I got to think about that. Um, am I able to be grateful for the good things even when difficult things happen? No matter what happens to me, should I be grateful? How do I make sense out of what I should be grateful for and really awful things that happen, <laughs> right? Which is, oddly enough, part of a theme that we'll get to in Dostoevsky. So that is the second reflection, is like w the wrestling, the, the um, part of taking that in and then really kind of having to work with it individually. Um, and I think that this is interesting because um, our stories, well, I'll say that in a minute. I'll, I'll hold off on that. So, so then, then if we go to back up to what indirect communication would be, so the direct communication is the guy saying, we should practice gratitude <laughs> or we should be grateful. You know, that's the direct communication. Um, the indirect communication would be perhaps seeing a grateful person <laughs> who's engaged in actually being thankful when, when good things happen or maybe even being grateful when difficult things happen. That would really be, that's like, they're not telling me anything, but they're like impacting me with that. I have to kind of wrestle with, um, wow. <laughs> um, and again, on second reflection, it's, would I do that? <laughs> would, how would I respond if that were me? Um, landing in this existing person that I am. Does that make sense? Is that tracking? How am I doing, Ron? Since you're the Kierkegaard reader these days. Okay. <laughs> Gail? So then you go looking for things that are positive. Mm -hmm. Is that the same mm -hmm. thing you're talking mm -hmm. about? It very much could be, exactly. Because that's another thing about the subjective is it's, it's going to be individual. And so your individual response to that question is going to be uniquely you. Okay. And mine will be uniquely me. Mm -hmm. And so that's the sense in which um, it's subjective because it's the subject that is engaged in it, okay. me as a subject. And then mm -hmm. I, I had another thought too, and I don't know if this makes sense, but like on the double reflection, oh, thanks Ron, like on the double reflection, um, like I was wondering how many times you've read that book by Dostoevsky, Dost I can't this book? name. Oh, only once all the way through. I've read different sections a handful of times. Yeah, so you've yeah. reread parts of it. I have reread parts so of it. So the first part, then the second part. Yeah. Like sometimes I reread books. Right. And is that is that qualified well, for double um, reflection? Mm, it, that's a little different, but okay. I think that's a really profound point. That um, I would say double reflection is more like, um, I mean, you could be double reflecting 
both times you read it. <laughs> For okay. Sure. Uh, I think that's um, what I was getting at. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And I think what's interesting about that observation is that that's one of the beauties of novels or literature is yeah. that you can go back to it mm -hmm. and because you're different the next right. time you read it, right. it's different. Yeah. It, it maybe tells you a different story. Yeah, and I, um, that's one thing I love about mm -hmm. literature. Yes, yes. You can go back to it over and over again. Yeah, very good. Thanks. Anybody else? Okay. Um, so then what I, um, Kierkegaard doesn't use the words content and process, but I think he's talking a lot about what, what I talk about, which is content and process. So um, that, and it's the same, it's the same relationship. So there's, there's the stuff that we believe, and then there's the process over time in which we engage it and believe it and maybe don't believe it and then believe it again <laughs> or, you know, it's like one of one of Kierkegaard's great themes is the idea of becoming. And so we don't, the, the direct, like if I'm studying something and I arrive at a conclusion because I, I got some data and I go, oh, that's what happened. Like if I'm studying history, okay, I can know from these sources now that's what happened. Well, that question's answered. <laughs> uh, I don't have to go back to it. Um, over and over again. But in this other subjective side, this double reflecting side, this process side, life does not complete <laughs> in those ways. And so our existing um, individual, uniquely us person is being impacted by different things at different times in our lives in different ways, just like what we were just saying about reading a book again and reading it years later and going, I didn't get that part at all because I didn't have that ready to receive, if, you, if, if that makes sense. And so this is our life in process. And, and certainly Kierkegaard's interest was in engaging a process of believing, of faith in the gospel. And, um, and I think that that's also what um, a lot of really great literature can engage us in double reflecting on what does this mean about being human? And I think that's one of Dostoevsky's biggest gifts to us. Um, so uh, let's see if that fits here. I'm going to put that somewhere else. Yeah, I'm going to put that later. Okay. So, okay. So enough about Kierkegaard. I think that was brief. That's a little less brief than I thought it would be, but that's good. Um, so, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about just the role of stories and so, um, how stories work in our lives. Um, and this is out of a book that I also recommend called The Healing Power of Stories by, um, a guy named Daniel Taylor. He says that our desire for meaning is the originating impulse of story. And so we, we, we live a narrative, we live stories and and it's our desire for meaning, our impulse toward meaning, that wants to organize things into uh, stories that make sense to us because we, we have an innate need to make sense of things. Um, seeing our lives as stories, he says, is more than a powerful metaphor. It's actually how experience presents itself to us. And so that's kind of what happens in life is a story, a, a narrative is told <laughs> in our lives. And, um, and we can have healthy stories or not healthy stories. So we can have stories that um, are broken or we can have stories that um, fit together well. Um, a, and broken stories can certainly be mended. Um, but having, uh, knowing and embracing a story that fits with true reality is what I would argue. Um, is crucial to living well and to living um, uh, in a way that makes sense. And so, of course, again, in the sense of becoming, that's not necessarily going to be finished. The story is going to continue to unfold um, as we make decisions and as we make choices. So, um, and this is certainly, I mean, this is a very powerful part of the work that I do. Um, I sit with people day after hearing their stories and and listening to how they're um, they're making sense out of their experience and and places where they they don't 
fit with their, you know, like places where the story they've been told or, or that they've created for themselves doesn't really fit with their experience. And so it, it like, it bumps. <laughs> and so we're, we're like trying to figure out, so what's, what's the trouble there? <laughs> like, where is it, where is it off? And one of the big things I talked about last time in my talk was that, um, that symptoms and, um, when we when we talk about symptoms in mental health, those symptoms are actually those ways, I think they're gifts from God to say something's not fitting. <laughs> and so we have an opportunity then to go to back up <laughs> and go, okay, what, what did we miss or what's not fitting? Um, is it the story that I've been told? Is it the story I've been telling myself? Um, and often, as I made the case last time, um, it's that we really want to move away from our painful experiences because a lot of times, and I think especially in our culture, um, we don't have a place for um, difficult experiences in our story. Our cultural story is one of success and victory and um, overcoming and all of these things. Well, even in Christian subculture, th those are that's like really big. <laughs> and so when we have difficult things, happen it doesn't match with what we've been told and so it, it yeah so um another role i think for stories is that um or another observation i should say is our values and convictions are expressed best in stories because they stories can preserve the memory of characters making choices and so we can be confronted by kind of like if I see this person that's gra that has gratitude even when difficult things happen and go, oh, <laughs> I don't know if I would do that. Um, the story I read in Dostoevsky, for example, is, oh, that's, I can remember that character being faced with this choice and making this particular choice. And that has impacted me so that I'm deciding, like, how am I going to respond when I'm impacted in similar ways? So, so stories change us. I said a moment ago about kind of how um, this book changed me a bit um, and continues to challenge me. Um, also, I think uh, it's interesting when we talk about reason and imagination and um, content and process, I think it's very true that we really can't argue anyone out of their story unless there's a better story to be <laughs> offered. <laughs> and so if, if another story is presented, then it works. But it's not usually, um, I mean, sometimes Lewis definitely used his reason in his conversion. I actually was someone who very much, it was an intellectual kind of um, journey and uh, struggle for me. But there was also all this other stuff going on, you know, and, and a lot of other stuff that I didn't even know was going on until way later when I could look back on it. And so, um, and that's where I'll give this illustration from, um, from Augustine, actually, who kind of wrote the first memoir, <laughs> if you will, uh, his book, Confessions. Um, he was, I think, in the process of trying on different stories, and he was certainly, at one point in his life, the indulgent youth hedonist uh, person. He was also a philosophical intellectual at another point, kind of telling the story of his identity, and he was also ambitious in his career. And so he had these different stories that he's trying on. Um, here's a quote from uh, one of the um, parts of the Confessions. We were alike, and he's talking about his experience of that sort of reason and, and imagination maybe kind of coming through. I don't know, maybe not. But we were alike deceivers and deceived in all our different aims and ambitions, both publicly when we expounded our so-called liberal ideas and in private through our service to what we called religion. In public, we were cocksure, in private, superstitious, and everywhere, void and empty. So that was his experience. And so what happened for Augustine, he had a mother who had, he had been, he had heard the Christian story his whole life because his mother had taught him that. So he knew the Christian story, but it wasn't compelling to him, right? He had to do all this other stuff. Um, and he also had Christian apologists who tried to corner him a lot <laughs> and uh, <laughs> tried to talk him into it. And that didn't happen, that didn't, wasn't how it happened either. 
apologists. apologists. Yeah, so people arguing f for the intellectual acuity of the Christian faith and saying, you know, this is why you should believe this because it's true. <laughs> and this is why it's true. And so, um, but it was actually his experience of Ambrose, um, the Bishop of Milan, who, he, this is what he says of him. This man of God received me like a father and as Bishop told me how glad he was that I had come. My heart warmed to him, not at first as a teacher of the truth, which I had quite despaired of finding in your church, but simply as a man who showed me kindness. And so it was this relationship that developed between him and Ambrose that actually gave him a different story, if you will. So he had all these stories, and then the, the story that his mother had told him suddenly came to life because he was cared about by Ambrose. I mean, that's a very simplistic view of the conversion of Augustine, but, but I think it's a powerful example in his words of how, um, how we aren't reasoned into the kingdom. <laughs> We're more often, um, hopefully, loved into the kingdom. So, um, okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about sort of the process of uh, the creative process. Um, I mentioned that sometimes I do a little bit of writing. I started writing, um, actually I started writing here, essays for News and Views was kind of the beginning. And then I um, expanded that. I, I did a number, of, it's been 10 or 12 years ago now, but I did a November NaNoWriMo, if you've ever heard of that, is National Novel Writing Month. And November, it's a thing that happens every November. And if you wanna sign up and do it, you should. But basically you have 30 days in November to write a novel. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did it one year. And I didn't write a novel though, I wrote a memoir. I wrote a memoir about my dog, Bo. <laughs> and, um, and I did it, I made it, I made it. Whew, slid into home base and wrote this memoir. Well, so as Anne Lamott says, I'll try to edit it for the recording because it would be bleeped if it was on public television. Um, she says uh, that you have to start with a crappy rough draft. And so your first draft is gonna be really bad <laughs> and then the work starts. And so I've heard other people say that um, the difference between uh, an amateur and a professional writer is the amateur thinks they're done when they finish <laughs> the first draft <laughs> and the professional writer knows that they've just begun. And so that is very true. So I have a really crappy first draft from that NaNoWriMo <laughs> month 10 years ago. Um, and, and then I began also working on a memoir of, of my spiritual journey. And I was in a writer's group for a long time. And one of the things that I noticed, and I also have a, a crappy first draft of that too. <laughs> I've, I've gone through it about three quarters, a second run through, and, um, and I'm still working with it. But um, so we'll see where that goes. But what I noticed was, and I, and I took a couple of writings, writing classes that were creative nonfiction and memoir kinds of classes to kind of think about how this works and what the process is. And one thing I noticed was the, the one of the writing teachers that I had who talked about memoir and creative nonfiction, which is kind of a genre that has emerged. It's now, it's, it's basically memoir, but it's sort of a, excuse me, it's sort of giving license to telling the story with a little bit more um, massaging, <laughs> if you will. So for example, um, there might be three different people in my story who had a particular role that I'm gonna have them as characters in my story. But because there were three or four maybe that I'm putting in there, it's kind of confusing for the reader. And so a device might be that I'm gonna combine them into a composite and kind of make them one person. So that isn't technically nonfiction, right? It's creative nonfiction. <laughs> and so it's an interesting name for a way of writing. And what occurred to me as I was in that process of kind of deciding as I wrote this, what am I, uh, what is factual and what is true, right? Because this is the question when, especially when you're talking about memoir or creative nonfiction, there's a difference between what's factual and what's true. And that's where this reason and imagination thing come in, right? So anyway, um, the novels that you read 
this is what I learned from this, and I would say this, it's um, almost always, if you read a novel, it started out as a memoir. <laughs> and not literally, but what I mean is the experiences, the characters that are written in a novel are out of the author's own experience. It's the only thing the author has to draw on, <laughs> quite honestly. I mean, to make a story, right? And so we're creating a story. Well, of course, you have a lot of other stuff to draw on. You have other people's stories. You have lots of characters. You have a lot to draw on. But, but really, it's the, the impulse to write the story to begin with is going to come out of what I want to say about my own story in some way. And so many novels have come out of a process of memoir. This is what I discovered that I thought was interesting is that um, it might start out as a memoir and then the author might decide, you know what, I'm going to take this in a different direction. <laughs> and, and then they make it a novel <laughs> because that's, it fits better or they want to change the story or they want to have it turn out differently or whatever it is. But that's um, kind of the impulse often behind novel writing that's very interesting. Another thing I heard m a lot in uh, my uh, classes about writing is show, don't tell. That's kind of a, a rule in, in creative writing is that you don't tell what happened, you show what happened. And so you, I mean, obviously you're telling some of it, but, but much more powerful is following a character's experience through the story rather than just being told. Um, Dimitri has a conversion experience after he gets arrested. I can tell you that, but Dostoevsky artfully and creatively brings you along with why that's significant <laughs> and like why that's shocking even. And th I hope I'm not plot spoiling, but that's kind of not really at the end or anything. <laughs> um, but that's a big deal, right? And so that's showing rather than telling. And that's a very powerful, um, when we read a novel, we're not going to like it that much if they're just telling us <laughs> what happened. It's not going to be as engaging. So um, that's the um, show, don't tell. And then the other piece is that um, I've heard this from my friends who write novels, that um, it's always interesting to hear them talk about how their characters change and evolve over the course of, and one of my friends who's in my writing group for those years um, was writing a novel and and she would be, she'd bring us a, a section to read and she'd say, so, you know, I didn't expect this person to do this thing, <laughs> but this is what they did. <laughs> and so even as an author, you kind of go, okay, <laughs> because you're creating a character and those characters make choices. So um, very interesting. And so, and in reading Dostoevsky, which I'm going to get to next, is those characters can actually even be really internally inconsistent <laughs> because guess what? Human beings are internally <laughs> inconsistent. <laughs> and so there's something that rings true about these characters when I can see how inconsistent they are. Um, and I think this is one of Dostoevsky's great gifts is that... Um, He's a master at giving space for the play of very different characters. Um, he, he writes a lot of different voices and he gives them freedom. He gives them freedom to think very differently. He never kind of makes them think what he wants them to think <laughs> necessarily, but he, um, because humans are undefinable, he gives a lot of freedom to his characters to express who they are and what, what's going on for them. Um, for any of you who aren't familiar with Dostoevsky, the person, he, um, I won't go into a lot of his biography, I don't know a lot of his biography, but what I do know is that when he was, um, I guess a college student, not far from a college student, he joined a, um, a political group that, um, got disbanded by the government and, um, he was arrested and put into a labor camp in Siberia. And so he spent a number of years in this labor camp um, as a prisoner, um, what we might call in some ways, um, in, in Siberia, the labor camps were where a lot of um, factory work happened and a lot of um, really hard labor. Um, 
they were also, because they were political prisoners, they were also, um, uh, I would say, tortured in certain ways. Um, one of the stories I remember hearing that was really striking to me was he went through what was a mock execution where they brought the set of prisoners out to a firing squad and they lined them up to shoot them and they shot them with blanks just to mess with them and then they let them go. And so uh, Dostoevsky had the experience of ready to meet his maker. <laughs> I mean, he thought he was dying. He thought he was going to be killed. And, and he wasn't. Um, another piece of that story is that when he arrived at the camp, or I don't know if you remember, anybody, you guys know this story, where um, all he had with him was like a, a little New Testament in his pocket. And so he actually had a New Testament with him in the camp that he hit, had hidden. And so that was something that he really hung on a lot. And so anyway, at any rate, he was finally released from the labor camp, and, um, but he was a very different person. And one of the ways that he was a different person was that his illusions about humanity were gone. He had seen the very worst of people and, um, and it haunted him. And I think this is one of the themes that he wrestles with throughout his writings is how awful people are and how much we suffer as a result of it. And that freedom is um, quite a big weight for humans. <laughs> um, he also saw the tension between the Western ideas that were coming into Russia at, at his time with Peter the Great. Uh, Russia was being kind of Westernized at that time. And, um, and he was saying, he was wanting to say, whoa. <laughs> and, and he wasn't saying no, he wanted to integrate the Western ideals with his with Russia's history and, and Slavic ideals, which were, I think, much more kind of, um, I don't know about faith-based, but certainly church-based um, in culture. So, um, so these are the questions that he's interested in, and they're the questions that he raises in the lives of his characters. Um, so... The, uh, in Brothers Karamazov, I'll give you a quick rundown. It's basically about four brothers who, um, whose father gets murdered. And one of them did it, but we don't know which one. <laughs> and so the, the novel unfolds with like, any one of them could have done it. <laughs> because they're all, I mean, he was not a nice guy. He had <laughs> um, They all had different reasons for, um, being angry with him. Uh, and so that's the plot. Um, another thing about this novel is it's not really plot driven, it's character driven, which is another really interesting distinction to me in reading novels is personally, I really like character driven stories more than plot driven. I like a good murder mystery too, you know, that's kind of plot driven. I'll go with The Firm, you know, or something like that. But, um, but these books are so rich, you know, when they're character driven more. So, um, and so the four brothers are Dmitri, Ivan, Alyosha, and Smernikov. Um, and, um, and what's so fascinating about it is each of these brothers represents a particular trait of being human. And so Dimitri, for example, is a hedonist. He's um, full of passions and um, he's ex exuberant. And, um, and also a big theme, by the way, is the Karamazov nature. The Karamazov nature is corrupt. And they have inherited this nature. They all see themselves as kind of prisoners of their nature because of being born Karamazovs. And like I said, their dad was not a great guy. So, um, so Dimitri <laughs> is the one that's full of passion and, and um, um, pleasure. Uh, Ivan is um, the intellectual, is really sold on reason. Uh, and Alyosha is the younger brother who is the spiritual brother. He's, a, he's training to be a monk as we enter the story. And then he has a crisis of faith and is deciding whether or not he's actually going to go forward and become a monk. Um, and then Shmerdikov is kind of represents 
the ugly in all of us. <laughs> I mean, he's kind of like this really weird sort of a half-brother kind of guy, and, and he's an interesting character and uh, really ugly. So uh, physically and um, existentially <laughs> ugly. So, um, okay, so one of the famous sections in um, Brothers Karamazov is um, Ivan's uh, Grand Inquisitor. This comes uh, fairly early on in the book, um, maybe in the first quarter, first third of the book. Um, and it's when Alyosha and Ivan get together for the first time in a long time. They haven't seen each other in a long time. And Ivan is kind of pushing at Alyosha to say, you know, what's this monk business for crying out loud? What are you thinking? <laughs> you know, and he's really pushing at him. And, um, and Alyosha is like, um, you know, you, you don't know me. Um, you have a heart of rebellion. <laughs> I mean, he's like, so don't think about that. But, um, so he doesn't really take him on a whole lot. But then Yvonne says, so I, I wrote a poem. He calls it a poem. But he says, I wrote this poem. I think you'd be interested in it. And Alyosha's like, you wrote something? <laughs> he goes, oh, I didn't write it, but I'm going to tell it to you. And so <laughs> it's, he spends, <laughs> yeah. So he spends many pages giving Alyosha this poem that he's written. And the basic plot of the story that he's telling Alyosha is that um, that Jesus comes back in, and it's like in the 1600s or something. So he says, this is a few hundred years ago. It's when Jesus has been gone for 1500 years and everybody's still waiting for him and thinking he's gonna come back. Like what a bunch of fools, right? And <laughs> this is Yvonne. And, and, uh, and he says, so I'm gonna tell you this story. Well, he comes back. So he came back, he performs a miracle on the church steps and this uh, cardinal guy, was he a cardinal? Anyway, it was church in Seville, I guess, set in Spain, I don't know why I picked that. But um, this uh, uh, Roman Catholic cardinal watches him uh, perform this miracle from a distance and goes and basically throws him in jail. So he says, why have you come back here to trouble us? And he puts him in jail and he sits in the cell with him. He goes into the jail with him and tells him everything wrong with what you did when you were here. <laughs> and, um, and he specifically goes back over the, the three temptations that Jesus the went through in the desert with, um, with the devil. And he says, this is why you should have taken him up on the bread and you should have said the miracles that, you know, jumping off of the, the pinnacle and being caught by God. People want miracles. You should have done that, you know, and done that thing. And then the last one is, of course, um, Satan shows him all the kingdoms of the world and says, if you'll bow down and worship me, do it. And the, pr the cardinal says to Jesus, that's what we did. And we're on his side now. Because people want authority. Freedom is too much for them. And that's where you went wrong. They wanted bread, you should have given them bread. They wanted miracles, you should have given them miracles. And they want authority. <laughs> they, they don't want this freedom, it's too much. Look at how much they've ruined themselves with all this freedom. They need authority. And so he's basically like telling Jesus what it's like, <laughs> right? And, and Alyosha interrupts him every now and then says, what are you talking about? <laughs> are you nuts? You know, he says he interacts with him a little bit, but not a ton. And then this is one of the sections I actually want to read um, where at the end, Yvonne, um, Alyosha is like saying, you know, you're nuts. Get me out of here kind of <laughs> at the end. And, um, and then Yvonne says, well, wait, 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 wait. I was going to tell you how it ends. <laughs> and he says, I was going to end it like this. When the inquisitor fell silent, he waited some time for his prisoner to reply. Oh, by the way, Jesus never says anything back to him, right, in this whole thing. Um, his silence weighed on him, Jesus' silence. He had seen how the captive listened to him all the while intently and calmly looking him straight in the eye and apparently not wishing to contradict anything. The old man would have liked him to say something, even something bitter, terrible. But suddenly he approaches the old man in silence and gently kisses him on his bloodless 90-year-old lips. That is the whole answer. The old man shudders. Something stirs at the corners of his mouth. He walks to the door, opens it, and says to him, 
Go, and do not come again. Do not come at all. Never, never. And he lets him out into the dark squares of the city, and the prisoner goes away. And Alyosha asks, and the old man? And Ivan, the kiss burns in his heart, but the old man holds to his former idea. So. Do you get how that's indirect? <laughs> that's challenging to, what, do, what is going on there? <laughs> and even Yvonne is like kind of inconsistent there, right? Um, and we find out how inconsistent later on in the book because we see a really different side of him later on. Um, so, and so then they continue their conversation a little bit and uh, Again, Alyosha doesn't really take him on, but he's like talking about like, this is really ridiculous and just kind of telling him. And then um, at the end, uh, I'll read this other, this last little paragraph. Oh, Alyosha was looking at him silently. I thought, brother, that when I left here, I'd have you at least in all the world. Yvonne spoke suddenly and unex with unexpected feeling. But now I see that in your heart, too, there is no room for me, my dear hermit. He's becoming a monk. The formula, everything is permitted. I will not renounce. And what then? Will you renounce me for that? Will you? Alyosha stood up, went over to him in silence, and gently kissed him on the lips. And then, of course, Yvonne cries, literary theft, which I think is really funny. <laughs> 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 um, so, um, so I hope that you're kind of getting the power of the story as it unfolds. Um, I was also going to read this section about um, Dimitri and the wee one. Maybe, maybe we, I don't know if we have time for that, but... Um, let me, let me go on, I might come back to that, but um, in Crime and Punishment, um, one of the things, when he says, um, at when uh, Yvonne says here, oh, I turned the page, <laughs> sorry. Uh, when he says uh, the formula, everything is permitted, this is a big theme that if there is no God, everything is permitted. And, um, and so he, Yvonne raises that theme here. Uh, Dostoevsky brings it back in, in Crime and Punishment, or actually it precedes the book, but um, in Crime and Punishment, he's working with that same idea. It's a study of the irrepressible workings of guilt. And that if we say, so Yvonne states it, everything is permitted if there's no God. Roskalnikov in Crime and Punishment shows us how the human heart betrays that view because what he does in Crime and Punishment, and again, not a plot spoiler because it happens right in the beginning, <laughs> he, um, <laughs> he decides to murder his landlord, a woman who has been unfair to him and who he doesn't like and who is really hard on people and the world would be better off without her in it. And so with his reason, he decides, and he's a student and he's read this particular author who has supported this view that um, that m murder is permissible. Everything, anything is permissible if there because there is no God. And so Raskolnikov reasons it out and says, you know, it'd be better if she weren't here. So he plans the murder. He um, practices the murder, and then he commits the murder. And the rest of the book is him running from his own conscience. And it's such a powerful psychological study of guilt. Um, that's the punishment. <laughs> that's the crime and that's the punishment. <laughs> There's other stuff unfolds in the book, of course. Um, and so this is in action, the logical conclusion in a story of this belief that all things are permitted. <coughs> um, and it's the play of human guilt and conscience um, and how that is irrepressible. We can't get away without it. And then I put uh, the use of Sonia. Sonia is an interesting character in Crime and Punishment. She's a prostitute who actually ends up um, having a really pretty significant role 
in Raskolnikov coming to faith in the end. Um, and I just think it's interesting that Dostoevsky chooses a prostitute to um, show humility and grace to Raskolnikov. I think that's um, his intention <laughs> is to highlight that. So, okay. Um, so I am actually almost done. So I'm going to read. I'm going to read the wee one. This is one of my favorite sections in um, Crime and Punish. In, uh, I'm sorry, in the Brothers Karamazov. Um, and it's a little bit longer than what I read before, so I hope that that's okay, that you don't mind being read to. Um, and in the book, in terms of the um, story of the book, Dimitri has been arrested, uh, accused of murdering his father, and arrested. We're at about this point in the book, so about two-thirds two -thirds of the way through. Um, so again, I hope I'm not plot-spoiling, but if you're like me, and you hear a story or watch a movie at this point in my life, I can watch it again in a year. I don't remember anything <laughs> about it. So, <laughs> so maybe that'll work for you, and you'll hear this, and then when you read it, you'll go, oh, I think I do remember hearing it. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> um, okay, so in this part, he's been arrested, um, and he's being interrogated for um, the murder of his father. There's a, also an interesting character in this book. Her name is Shenka. She's also basically a woman with a history and a reputation, and he falls in love with her, and um, and she with him, and they. Uh, but she's she's not spotless either. I mean, it's kind of interesting how he uses this um, just this broken, inconsistent kind of human to tell these stories. Um, and so she's there with him at the interrogation. She's also interrogated because she um, was around him or something. They want to know what she knows about the murder and, and that kind of thing. And so they are in interviewing her. And um, excuse me. And um, let's see where I'm, where I'm going to start. <coughs> Okay, so she um, <coughs> she finishes being interviewed, um, interrogated, and the um, detective says that she can go back to her own town if she wants to and all that, but she ends up staying. Um, she says, uh, so she was finally dismissed. Parfenovich, he's the detective, impetuously announcing to her that she could even return to town at once um, blah, blah, blah. I humbly thank you, Grushenka, bowed to him. I'll go with that little man, the landowner. I'll take him back with me. But meanwhile, I'll wait downstairs with your permission until you decide here about Dmitri Fedorovich. Um, and, and by the way, also, if you're ever going to read Dostoevsky or any Russian novel, Tolstoy, Tolstoy is the same. Each character has about five names. <laughs> and that'll throw you off at first. <laughs> because the way the Russians do names is really interesting but they have different names. So Dimitri is also called Mitya, Mitya. And so I was just about to say, she went out, Mitya was calm and even looked quite encouraged, that's Dimitri. Um, but only for a moment. Um, some strange physical powerlessness was gradually overwhelming him. His eyes kept closing with fatigue. The interrogation of the witnesses finally came to an end. They moved on to the final editing of the transcript. Mitya got up went from his chair to the corner near the curtain, lay down on a large chest covered with a rug, and was asleep in a second. He had a strange sort of dream, somehow entirely out of place and out of time. It seemed he was driving somewhere in the steppe, which is a part of Russia. It's a um, geographic, geological formation. It's kind of a mesa, uh, or it's a part of the, I don't know if that's actually right, but anyway. Uh, he was out in the steppe, which is kind of in the wilderness a little bit, in a place where he had served once long ago. He is being driven through the slush by a peasant in a cart with a pair of horses, and it seems to Mitya that he is cold. It is the beginning of November, and snow is pouring down in big wet flakes that melt as soon as they touch the ground. And the peasant is driving briskly, waving his whip nicely, and he has a long, fair beard, and he is not an old man, maybe around 50, dressed in a gray peasant coat. 
and there is a village nearby, black, black huts, and half the huts are burnt, just charred beams sticking up. And at the edge of the village, there are peasant women standing along the road, many women, a long line of them, all of them thin, wasted. Their face is a sort of brown color, especially that one at the end. Such a bony one, tall, looking as if she were 40, but she may be only 20, with a long, thin face. And in her arms, a baby is crying, and her breasts must be all dried up, not a drop of milk in them. And the baby is crying, crying, reaching out its bare little arms, its little fists somehow all blue from the cold. Why are they crying? Why are they crying? Mitya asks, flying past them at a great clip. The wee one, the driver answers. It's the wee one crying. And Mitya is struck that he has said it in his own peasant way, the wee one, and not the baby. And he likes it that the peasant has said, wee one. There seems to be more pity in it. But why is it crying, Mitya insists, as if he were foolish? Why are its little arms bare? Why don't they wrap it up? The wee one's cold. Its clothes are frozen. They don't keep it warm. But why? Why is it so? Foolish Mitya will not leave off. They're poor, burnt out. They've got no bread. They're begging for their burnt down place. No, no, Mitya still seems to not understand. Tell me. Why are these burnt out mothers standing here? Why are the people poor? Why is the wee one poor? Why is the step bare? Why don't they embrace and kiss? Why don't they sing joyful songs? Why are they blackened with such black misery? Why don't they feed the wee one? And he feels within himself that though his questions have no reason or sense, he still certainly wants to ask in just that way. And he should ask in just that way. And he also feels a tenderless, tenderness, such as he has never known before, surging up in his heart. He wants to weep. He wants to do something for them all, so that the wee one will no longer cry, so that the blackened, dried up mother of the wee one will not cry either, so that there will be no more tears in anyone from that moment on. And it must be done at once, at once, without delay, and despite everything with all his Karamazov unrestraint. <laughs> um, and again, Dmitri, we know by now, is a hedonist. He doesn't care about people. <laughs> he just wants pleasure, right? And so this is a very significant moment to have for him to have this dream with all his Karamazov unrestraint. Um, and then he hears a voice, and I am with you too. I won't leave you now. I will go with you for the rest of my life. The dear, deeply felt words of Grushenka came from somewhere near him. His whole heart blazed up and turned towards some sort of light, and he wanted to live and live, to go on and on along some path towards the new beckoning light, to hurry, hurry, right now at once. What? Where? He exclaims, opening his eyes and sitting up on the chest as if he were just coming out of a faint and smiling brightly. Over him stands um, Nikolai Parfenovich the detective, inviting him to listen to the transcript and sign it. Mitya guessed that he had slept for an hour or more, but he did not listen to Nikolai Parfenovich. It suddenly struck him that there was a pillow under his head, which, however, had not been there when he had sunk down powerlessly on the chest. Who put that pillow under my head? What good person did it? He exclaimed with a sort of rapturous gratitude in a sort of tear-filled voice, as though God knows what kindness had been shown to him. A good man remained unidentified even later, the good man, perhaps one of the witnesses or even uh, Parfenovich's clerk had arranged that a pillow be put under his head out of compassion. But his whole soul was as if shaken with tears. He went up to the table and declared that he would sign whatever they wanted. I had a good dream, gentlemen, he said somehow strangely with a sort of new face, as if lit up with joy. <laughs> what do you make of that? <laughs> um, so, again, indirect communication that kind of brings us toward contemplating what's true, what's real, 
what's um what what is going on there <coughs> and how am i going to engage with it and respond to it okay so i'm going to wrap up um this is a shakespeare quote too bad cindy's not here for this um, <laughs> Um, imagination apprehends more than cool reason ever comprehends. <coughs> and so imaginatively speaking, we hear stories and we resonate with them. Um, and so now I just want to say that, um, again, these two great faculties that we are given for integrating fact and value, subject, object, um, reason and imagination integrated. So uh, this is out of a book that I highly recommend also by Malcolm Geit, Faith, Hope, and Poetry. Have you read that book? Have you seen, Chris, have you seen that book? You'd like it. I bet you'd like it. Um, I had the opportunity to do a workshop, a poetry workshop with Malcolm this past summer. Um, and so anyway, um, he argues that imagination is indeed a truth-bearing faculty and um, that there is no language and no knowledge without symbol and metaphor. I think that's a powerful observation. Um, and so we do have to ask questions of the novels that we read. We, we want to discover whether or not they are truth-telling. And so the biggest, the one of the best ways to ask that question is this novel, Truth Bearing, is to um, ask whether it is internally consistent and also consistent with other ways of knowing. And so it isn't going to contradict or, um, or turn reason on its head, it's going to flow with reason. And so with what I know from other sources, which might be scripture might be my experience um a lot of different um ways that our reason interacts with discovering what's true um but imagination is also truth bearing and so to find these creative um expressions of um of truth are, are is really powerful and the novel and certainly dostoevsky i recommend um so the imagination as a truth-bearing faculty, we need both to understand why it came to be marginalized. So that's kind of a history of ideas question, sort of why did, <coughs> why did, how did we get here that that's been so marginalized? And also ask in what ways it's consistent with and also complementary to truth arrived at by other means. Um, so are these works offering imaginative insights that are both internally consistent and consistent with our other ways of knowing? that's going to be our best um, reach for discovering whether or not um, we can trust the truth of a novel. And again, there's when we come back to Kierkegaard, <coughs> there's object and there's objective and subjective. You might ascertain some truth, but that double reflection is what's um, actually going to uh, resonate for us and whether the story is factual or not, it might be a true story. Um, how does the story impact me? And does this story change how I live my existing life? So that's the double reflection. That's the um, engagement that we can bring. That was supposed to be a picture of Dostoevsky on there. <laughs> or, or a mountain range, maybe. I forget what I put on there. But anyway from another of his books, The Idiot. Um, Beauty will save the world. So, the end. Questions, comments? Oh, uh-huh. Um, I think the one of the ways it changed my life was, um, I don't know, it kind of made me a reader more than I had been, for one thing, because it was so rich. And I and actually had read, I had read Crime and Punishment before I read Brother Matzoff. And so that was also a really um, 
really powerful book for me because I, I think I didn't know that an author, I mean, just, he's a genius. I mean, you know, <laughs> he's amazing. Uh, Tolstoy too. I mean, I really, I love these old Russians that write giant novels. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, I think the way that it changed me was in sort of becoming a reader more and also just really loving the depth of these characters mm -hmm. and um, and the engagement of these questions that I think for me um, have always been sort of these existential questions of my own coming up through science when I, um, as a scientist, I converted to atheism. And so I believed for a long time that there was no God and, and I couldn't quite, uh, figure out how that could mean that all things were permitted. It was the logical conclusion of that belief, but I, I couldn't go all the way there. <laughs> um, and so I think when I read Crime and Punishment in particular, it was like, there it is. <laughs> we can't because we are human beings and, um, and there is a God <laughs> and that's what's true. And so I just loved how he captured those questions and those experiences. And then he does it even more th deeply, I think, in the Brothers Karamazov where, um, you know, these characters like, I, I mean, we resonate with each and every one of these brothers who represent these different parts of us, you know. And they each go through their own existential journey over the course of the, the novel. And they, they don't necessarily wind up where you think they will. <laughs> But um, but it's fascinating to to live with them and follow them for all those pages <laughs> that you think you would never get to the end of. <laughs> so is that? Yeah. yeah. That's helpful. I have one other um, minor question, <coughs> just kind of off off the beaten path question, and mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to make sense of how this works. So like right now, I'm reading um, Wolf Hall, um, and I'm really enjoying it. Um, and you made the comment that, um, and which I think makes sense to me that most books are, I don't think you said autobiographical. Auto, oh, uh -huh. yeah, uh, memoir. yeah, they start are, out as a memoir. Kind of. But that's yeah. like, this is historical fiction. Oh, okay. S uh, set in the 1500s. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how does that all work? Mm -hmm. Do, do mm -hmm. you have well, an opinion on that? Yeah, I don't know that everything, I mean, I guess what I would say about that is this is an interest that the author has. And so their interest in it kind of goes toward creating and I think that where they infuse it is well if I were in that setting what would what would I do if I were in the moment of history that I'm writing about and so they're still kind of infusing themselves and their experience I think into it as humans so um and and something you said there made me think of another comment I wanted to make um oh right about truth and novels that was the title, right? Um, that, um, that we can read the way that the imagination is a truth-bearing faculty. What I don't mean by that is that the imaginative author is always telling the truth. I don't actually mean that. What I mean more is, I mean, they may be or they may not be, but as I double reflect on my imaginative engagement with that, I believe that that is a truth-bearing faculty and that, that I can trust my sense and bring it together with my reason to make sense out of what I think is true about the story that they're telling. That what's, in that sense, what's true for me, which is kind of a, I don't mean it the way the postmoderns mean it <laughs> necessarily, but, um, but it's that idea of like my imagination. I, I think of it as um, really good literature in this way, and um, I think, uh, the invisible world is here, right? Right in this room with us. But we don't see it because it's invisible. And every once in a while, the veil is lifted. And I think art, poetry, literature are, are ways that that veil is lifted and suddenly we see through to something true and real. And I think that's kind of a way that our imagination is engaged in truth-bearing. Um, and I'm not talking about seeing visions necessarily. I'm just talking about, I, I think about like the transfiguration, you know, when Jesus took the disciples up to the top of the mountain and all of a sudden Moses and Elijah were there. It's like, <laughs> I've never really understood that, but it's like they were there, 
They were there before and after that. But the veil was lifted and they could see them. And and then it it closed down again. And of course they were like, no, let's stay here. <laughs> um, So I think that um, good art is, um, as indirect communication in that sense, yeah. can lift that veil and give us... Um, right. And that leads me to, when you were talking, I was thinking about this, like, I think um, having been around a few artists uh, mm -hmm. and myself sometimes when I'm doing something that's artistic, there's a sense where something happens and it takes on its own life. Yes. And right. like, like if Bob was painting, he would not go into a trance but there's a moment where he says <laughs> it's um, it's taken on its own life yeah. and you said that about mm -hmm. the characters um right. that they yeah. you know they're gonna do their own thing mm -hmm. and i think mm -hmm. that's kind of almost what you're talking about yes isn't it yes okay yeah thanks it is. yeah good well, if uh, no one else has a question, I, I guess I have one for you. Thank you very much, okay. Nancy. That was yeah. wonderful. I especially liked how you uh, let some of those passages show Just, uh -huh. for, uh, for themselves. Good. Um, my question has to do with uh, one of the points on one of the most recent slides, uh, how, to, how to ask oneself whether a story is true. Not again whether it's factual, but whether a story is true. Um, and I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on um, the psychological uh, perspicacity of someone like Dostoevsky. How is it that uh, one can, um, how is one able to depict four different characters of very different kinds and have each of those characterizations mm -hmm. be um, realistic in some way? Because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I have to admit to a slight prejudice against the novel because I feel like I've read novels where um, they were trying to make a point, and they made this point by um, delineating a character and contriving mm -hmm. events that happened to this character and inserting lines into the mouths of these characters. These were talking heads, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to go very far afield to think of novels like that. Right. Um, Atlas Shrugged, something like that, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. um, I love many novels, but they tend to be, I wouldn't call them plot driven, I would call them language driven in some ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the, um, the the kind of poetry, although I use that, that term very loosely, yeah. that uh, stories in the mm -hmm. forms of, mm -hmm. of novels make possible that, that appeals to me. But um, mm -hmm. let's, let's take Crime and Punishment. So uh, on the one hand, you seem to be saying that we have to um, submit these to double reflection. We have to ask whether mm -hmm. these things um, are consistent with our own understanding of reality. But what if we don't know, for instance, whether um, uh, guilt can haunt one throughout one's life? What mm -hmm. if we haven't um, mm -hmm. made the experiment of uh, whether everything Hopefully is permitted? Hopefully not. Hopefully not, right? right. Uh -huh. um, but, <laughs> so Dostoevsky himself, his experiences is limited. Um, many of the mm -hmm. things he writes about, he's never experienced personally. Uh, to what extent can uh, the experiences he describe be true, um, mm -hmm. especially when they are on a far greater scale? Um, mm -hmm. He hasn't premeditated, as far as we know, from the historical record, the murder of anyone. Um, and mm -hmm. how is it possible? How is this possible for anyone to do in a kind of realistic way? to use the imagination and kind of leap from mm -hmm. personal experience, mm -hmm. extrapolate, right. put oneself in someone right. else's shoes. And mm -hmm. I'm especially asking, um, because you have so much clinical experience, mm. uh, how are you mm -hmm. able to put yourself mm. in someone else's shoes in mm. any sort of way um, that allows mm. you to help this person arrive at mm -hmm. reality, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <sighs> uh, well, hmm. I could take that a couple of different directions. I'm kind of deciding. Um, one is I'm thinking, he actually, I think, did have a lot of personal experience. He certainly didn't premeditate a murder, to my knowledge. <laughs> um, but he watched that happen up close, sadly, um, in the camps. And also, um, he did have a gambling problem. <laughs> so he certainly had his own demons. Um, 
So I think that those kind of experiences lead us toward, um, <coughs> I think his characters having some reality to them. I totally get what you're saying. I don't like novels that just put words into characters' mouths. And I think in, in a way, that's one of the things I love about this novel is that I feel like he creates these characters from kind of behind them <laughs> in a way, you know, and like all of a sudden we kind of know who they are. And um, so I like that about it, but I could see where you know, it might seem a little bit contrived in places as well. I think um, psychologically speaking, um, the way that I engage people's stories that I may or may not believe are true stories, um, often I think um, uh, if I want to challenge someone's story, I have to first really follow their story to make sure that I've really heard it. And so I am really trying to put myself in, into their shoes. And then to find kind of where, where that bump is that I'm talking about. Like, because even people who, who don't believe Christianity or don't claim Christianity um, and don't have any intention of doing that, I work with a lot of people in that category and I'm still finding where their stories, where what they believe don't fit with their experience. and, and helping them come to a better understanding of their own experience. I, I, my perspective is that I certainly cannot um, know people's hearts and I can't know what God is doing in the, in the deep recesses of their hearts, but I feel like what I can do is um, join with them and listen really intently <coughs> so that they can discover what they believe. Um, and I think the, the the way that I can hopefully help them toward truth is um, in service of the gospel in some way in their lives. So I never know the outcome of that. I'm that's a seed planter <laughs> and not a harvester. <laughs> um, but I but I think that that's significant because I I can't I don't have access to that part right. But I do have access to a story that either fits or doesn't fit, and I can help them kind of work with what doesn't fit about it and um, and even if I mean God may never come into the conversation but he's in that process um, does that answer a little bit of what you're getting at yeah yeah so I think a creative author is um, I think maybe trying to do the same thing in a way to like my friend whose character wow, look at what they did this week. <laughs> you know, <laughs> didn't see that coming. Um, you know, and, and that's, I think, also one of Dostoevsky's gifts is that um, in uh, he's polyphonic, I guess is one of the words, as opposed to monophonic, which means he uses many voices to, um, and he gives his, his characters a lot of freedom to believe what they believe, to say what they want to say. And he's not trying to, like, have one have the characters all say one thing <laughs> right um and so yeah i think that that's kind of a cool um challenge as an author um yeah Lu oh go ahead well i was gonna say this also makes the observation that um truth and fiction i forget how he says this but something like um truth has this weird ring to it that fiction will never have <laughs> And that, because um, fiction can is going to be smoother because we're writing it, right? Um, but reality is never that smooth. And so he he kind of says one of the ways I know something is true is if it has this weird kind of thing <laughs> that you wouldn't guess or wouldn't see coming, kind of if that makes sense in experience. So anyway. Um, so I don't know exactly how to frame this question, um, but it was something that you said in response to something she said um, with regard to if, some, if a novel is truth-bearing. Would you say that it's kind of congruent with Kierkegaard's idea of subjectivity is truth when he says that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So... Um, Kierkegaard has a theme where he, he talks about truth as subjectivity. And so for Kierkegaard, um, something, uh, well, he, and he's not doing epistemology in my opinion. He's, um, 
he believes the Bible. He he's not like saying, um, let's throw that out and make up our own stuff. <laughs> <You know? laughs> he's not saying that at all. <laughs> he is totally and firmly believes the Bible is true. And um, but when he says truth is subjectivity, what he means is, as best I can tell, is that um, is that the way we engage the truth of the Bible and how it penetrates us and how we decide we're going to respond to it, um, whether or not we're going to step over the ditch. <laughs> he talks about the leap of faith and the ditch is either, he says it's either a foot wide or a mile wide, but you still have to step. And, and so the decision is very much a part of his thing. And so truth as subjectivity, is if someone ma is, it makes that choice and makes that decision, to actually hear the gospel and move toward staking one's life on it, they've just stepped over the ditch. And you can't get there any other way. <laughs> and so that's a subjective, inward, existing decision. And that's what he's talking about when he says truth is subjectivity. Because the truth of the Bible doesn't really matter. <laughs> he doesn't think it's not true. He thinks it's true. But it doesn't really matter unless you step over the ditch. <laughs> so. But we're just starting to look at the truth of what we can impart in the micro, so don't say too much. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 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 Might be giving something away there, huh? Yeah, yeah. Um, in the micro class for the juniors, they read um, uh, Concluding Scientific Postscript by Kierkegaard, and I had the honor and privilege and fun of doing that class for a number of years. And so I've read the first half of Concluding <laughs> Scientific Postscript <laughs> many times, uh, slowly with students. And it's been, I think, I think it's a, an amazing book. And I've never even finished it. But <laughs> anyway, okay. Thanks, everybody.